Good morning, everyone. I know yesterday was a productive day, and very pleased to welcome you to day two of Sir Week 2024. And to begin, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Mike Worth, who's the chairman and CEO of Chevron. Mike, come and join. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. So, Mike, uh, one of our colleagues at, uh, uh, at S&P, Lou Carranza, for 10 years was at MIT. He's now the managing director of Sear Week. And he mentioned uh, that in 2019, you set up a program at MIT to uh, train uh, people from Chevron on AI. Uh, that's five years ago. What did you see that uh, led you at that point to set up that program? Well, um, first of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, as we look at hiring, uh, we're still doing a, having a really good success in hiring all the disciplines we need in our industry, and they're very diverse and um, technical in nature. Uh, the one area I would say was becoming more difficult were data scientists and people that understood where the world was headed with digital technologies and uh, had the skills to do things like we're seeing now with AI. And, um, and, and they, they tend to want to go work for OpenAI or Google, and, and so it was harder and harder for us to, to recruit people in with that talent. And I knew the president at MIT, and I had a conversation with him, and I said, you know, rather than us trying to go compete for this talent and finding that it's really difficult, what if we had a different program where we take um, smart uh, geologists, geophysicists, engineers that are five to 15 years in their career, and we send them to MIT for a year to get a degree in data science and machine learning and all the things that are going on. Uh, can you help us craft something that can build off their domain knowledge of earth sciences and chemistry and chemical engineering and give them the skills to understand how you integrate these new powerful data tools into our business where they've got deep domain knowledge, but we don't really have the, the, the depth in, um, in these emerging data sciences. And so we set a program up and we take about 30 people a year from our company, we call them the Digital Scholars, and they go back to MIT. We now have set something up at Rice as well. And they're, they're paid their regular salary. If they've got a family, their family moves. And we pay for their family to, to live there as well. And their job is to go back to school for a year and, and learn where this is all headed. Now, it's one of those things, it sounds interesting. I've gone and sat in on a lecture to, uh, to, to get a look at it. But, you know, if, I don't know if you've ever had that nightmare where you find yourself back in school and you forgot to go to the class. <laughs> you all the time. The final exam. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm sending our bright young people to go do this because I looked at them. I don't know if I can handle this myself. But uh, anyway, we've got about 150 people now who have been through this program or will be as of the, the, the most recent graduating class. And they come back in to help us solve the big problems, the big challenges that we see in our business, uh, whether it's safety, reliable operations, how do you improve your performance and exploration? There's so many different areas where we've always applied these kinds of tools to improve performance in this industry. And, uh, and we partner up with all the big technology companies to, to do this. But we've got people now who are much more able to see the problems, understand what technologies might help address those problems, and then work to bring those into our business. I imagine several people in the audience would like to sign up for this program. So, <laughs> uh, And so um, what specific was AI at that time on your mind and on your radar screen? It, it was. I mean, there's this whole suite of uh, digital technologies, remote sensing, uh, drones, and autonomous vehicles, um, machine learning, AI, and, and the opportunity to integrate those. Uh, and it's what we've always done in this industry is integrate different kinds of technologies to create breakthroughs. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so it was, it was all of those, and you could see them doing, one of the first things I did with our leadership team when I came into the role is we went and spent uh, two or three days in Silicon Valley. And we didn't look at energy technology, we looked at the technology, you know, autonomous vehicles and people that were using satellites to monitor the uh, level of roofs in floating crude oil storage tanks and using kind of you know, middle school geometry to figure out where was the roof and therefore how much oil was in that tank and do accurate uh, global inventory 
counts using tools that we'd never seen before. So, so I really wanted my leadership team to be exposed to how the world was changing and then say, what does that uh, lead us to look at and how do we prioritize bringing technologies into our business that can help improve performance? And uh, with a, a cadre of 150 people, you can see the impacts of the program. We, we are. We're, we're, we're bringing these technologies in now on, um, you know, if, if anybody's looked at this, you know, people are using um, machine learning and AI, doctors are, to look at x-rays and read x-rays more accurately and more rapidly. Uh, you can do the same thing with radiography on welds and get right. much better interpretation on that. Um, we're using it for some of our sub subsurface applications. We're using it for production forecasting in the Permian. We've built digital twins of refineries and LNG plants, and you can now model things. You can troubleshoot things remotely. So there's a, a whole host of applications that we're already seeing. So you get greater efficiencies and cost savings from it. Safety, reliability, lower cost, uh, greater efficiency, all the things that have always driven value and performance in our business. You know. So it must be uh, the app people apply from within the company and or get nominated? It, it, yeah, it's, um, the, people can apply, supervisors have to yep. approve it. And it's, uh, it's been a pretty competitive process. We get a lot of people that uh, would like to get paid to go back to school. school for for, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, ours are better. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and obviously it has an impact on the upstream. Hey, upstream, downstream, yep, midstream. Yep. I mean, it, it, every part of our business will be transformed by these technologies. Right. So uh, let's talk about the upstream and turn to the Permian, and uh, where I assume that these techniques are being applied. Uh, uh, what do you see? You have pretty aggressive targets for the Permian. How do you see that happening? Yeah, I would say our, our targets are the, you know, I'm not sure I'd characterize them as aggressive, Dan. They're the, the same targets we've been carrying for a number of years. We've been on a steady program to try to drive very um, capital efficient development of our position, which is a large position and it's a very advantaged one with low or no royalty across most of the acreage. And so uh, we're looking to drive strong returns and, and that's the primary uh, metric that we work towards. And um, in doing that, uh, you know, we've been on a trajectory for several years to reach a million barrels a day of production in 2025. We continue to be on that path. Uh, we, we finished with our highest year of production in the Permian last year ever. Um, we were well north of 800,000 barrels a day in the fourth quarter of, of last year. And uh, we'll be kind of flat for the first part of this year as we're building up some uh, drilled but uncompleted wells and bringing on another completion crew uh, in right. the second half of the year. But, uh, you know, the Permian continues to deliver. I think it's a great resource for the United States. It's a great resource for this industry. And it's another one where with recoveries at relatively low levels of the, you know, the hydrocarbons in place, uh, if we can find ways to use technologies to unlock better recoveries, there there's still tremendous upside. Right. Are there big learnings that have come as you've gotten up to 800,000 barrels and looked to a million? Yeah, you know, one of the biggest learnings, I think, is um, not a particularly um, profound one, but it is uh, early on you really focus on... Uh, planning and drilling and executing your new well queue, as you get up to 800,000 barrels a day, you've got a big base business that you got to run really well. And so the kinds of things around um, asset and equipment reliability, offtake capacity, um, it's the blocking and tackling to run a big business every day that you really have to focus on. And the uh, incremental production is important and you want to execute that very well also. But, you know, a 5% slip on 800,000 barrels a day is 40,000 barrels. Yeah. So you, you really have to pay attention to the, the fundamentals as you build a business that big. Right. Another big geography for you, of course, is Kazakhstan and big expansion there. What's, what's the shape there? Yeah, so for, for those that aren't familiar, uh, we entered Kazakhstan shortly after it became an independent country, uh, took a, a field that was doing a few tens of thousands of barrels a day up to today um, in the ballpark of about 650,000. And we've got a project underway that uh, will start up uh, uh, over the rest of this year and into next year. We'll be at full uh, production next year of over a million barrels a day. And a uh, big project, complex project's been underway for a, for a decade uh, through pandemics, through changes in government and, and um, 
you know, the war in Ukraine. So a number of um, unexpected kind of external issues that have uh, occurred during that period of time. So a complex project to execute. It's coming online a little bit later than we had expected and at a higher cost. So we, we, we haven't executed as well as we would have expected when we went into it, but it's well on track. The uh, commissioning and startup activities are in full swing right now and uh, progressing very well. And, uh, you know, we, we update our investors every quarter on it because it's a, it's a big, big important project right. for our company. So it's obviously one of the big foundations of the company. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Another geography that's uh, in the news is Guyana. Mm. <laughs> what was that look? <laughs> um, how, to, how to phrase the question. Uh, it, it came up in discussion yesterday. Um, I'm still trying to find that next sentence. Uh, um, what is your well? How does it, how are things going on the? <laughs> You're doing a, a merger with Hess. You're not usually tongue tied. <laughs> you know where I'm trying to go. <laughs> yeah. Now, to be be serious, uh, uh, what is your reaction to the uh, discussion? Obviously, we heard yesterday from Darren Woods. Uh, Exxon Mobil's perspective. How does Chevron look at the situation? Yeah, I I, um, I just arrived last night, so I didn't I didn't see all of. <laughs> yes, but I saw some of the um, coverage of it. Look, a uh, couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, this transaction is an important one. It's good for for Chevron shareholders. It's good for Hess shareholders. It's good for the country of Guyana. I think it's good for U.S. Um, energy security. Good good for the industry. So uh, we think it's a, a, an important deal and a good deal. Um, for the record, uh, we have worked hard to engage the Staybrook Block partners uh, privately and constructively for several months. Uh, we uh, tried to help them uh, address the issues that they had uh, raised and achieve the objectives that they had communicated to us. Uh, we were surprised when they um, a couple of weeks ago, abruptly ended those discussions and um, and publicly announced that they were going to file, or they had filed for uh, for arbitration. Uh, we uh, did extensive diligence on the joint operating agreement uh, during the negotiation of the contract. Uh, we have extensive experience with these types of agreements around the world, as does Hess, and we remain very confident in our understanding of the language and look forward to seeing it affirmed in arbitration. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, let's turn now to new energies and what uh, Chevron's doing and its agenda there. Uh, it looks like you have three major areas, hydrogen, CCUS, and biofuels. And I think you have a specific hydrogen project that's advanced now. We, we do. We've got those three plus what we call emerging, so geothermal and some other things that, uh, that we're also working on. Um, in hydrogen, uh, I think the project you're referring to is one in Utah. It's in, uh, in southern Utah. And it's an interesting project where uh, we will use uh, wind, particularly excess wind at a time when it prices at low, low prices or even negative pricing at times. And we'll use that to run um, electrolyzers to, uh, uh, to create uh, green hydrogen. And uh, we'll store that hydrogen in underground salt caverns. This is a, a unique uh, geography where you can actually find salt uh, deposits that you can mine out like you do typically along the Gulf Coast. And so we can store hydrogen uh, as we manufacture it, and then we can bring it back to be co-fired in a natural gas uh, combined cycle power turbine. And uh, so the plan is to uh, convert a coal-fired plant, and this is not our investment, it's the, the power utilities investment, uh, convert a coal-fired plant over to gas, and then over time bring more gas or, or more hydrogen in to co-feed with the gas. And then the power, a lot of the power comes down into California. So it'll be one of the first green hydrogen projects in the US is under construction right now. 
and uh, is intended to start up next year. Uh, and it's set up uh, to be developed in multiple phases. And so uh, the first phase looks economic. We've got contracts, customers, everything is, is progressing and construction is underway. Uh, but it could be scaled up and, and become much larger over time if we can develop additional markets and, uh, and find additional customers. So uh, exciting. We're working on uh, what's called blue hydrogen or hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture and storage. A couple of different opportunities here on the Gulf Coast and then you know, looking at hydrogen opportunities elsewhere in the world okay. as well. So a big theme of the conference this year is about hydrogen markets, creating hydrogen markets, so very relevant to what you're saying. CCUS? Uh, similar uh, approach. We're looking uh, primarily in uh, Gulf Coast, uh, west coast of the U.S., and then Asia. Uh, for reasons, we've got uh, emissions footprints in those areas. We've got a lot of business in those areas, and um, and and understand how to operate there. Uh, the the one that is uh, furthest along is here in uh, on the Gulf Coast. It's called Bayou Bend. We've got over a billion tons of storage, and uh, are putting down. Uh, wells right now to be sure we can further characterize the uh, the pore space and the uh, and the storage capacity working with customers to uh, you know we had negotiations underway on term sheets right now with a number of uh, different prospective customers and um, you know we've got to get through the well permitting uh, process with with EPA uh, Texas has not yet been granted primacy Louisiana has so they've taken over permitting in Louisiana we'd like to see the same happen here in Texas so that we can you know have a greater confidence in the cycle time and, and actually getting is permitting permits is permitting being an issue I think permitting is an issue the other thing that's an issue is um, you know just the commercial structure of these ventures is new uh, it's a little bit if, like if you go back and look at LNG decades ago you typically want to have um, large uh, long-term contracts in place to underpin a, a significant investment. And emitters are um, still looking for the right structure so they can um, uh, feel confident in that. And it's, it's a new business model. And so you allocate investment risk returns, uh, manage liability across a new value chain yeah. with large, pretty sophisticated players uh, from the emitters all the way through to storage is, uh, is something that takes time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're working on that with a number of customers. I know many others in the industry are working on similar things. And I think it's, uh, you know, people are making progress for the, on these commercial frameworks works, which will be uh, really important. What do you see as the roadway on biofuels to getting to scale? Well, the technologies are pretty well established. The markets are here, whether you're talking the federal uh, renewable fuel standard or the California low carbon fuel standard have created uh, demand for them. The, uh, one of the biggest challenges over time is likely to be feedstocks. Yeah. And so the availability of feedstocks, uh, there's so much used cooking oil and distillers corn oil. There's, um, you know, uh, food crops like soy that can come into this value chain. Uh, we're working uh, with partners in the agricultural sector on new ideas, uh, certain cover crops that could be used and rotated with other crops, uh, crops that might have higher oil contents. Uh, but ultimately, uh, feedstock will become a, a real challenge. It is today, and it's it's no different than traditional refining, right? You want to have um, a cost-efficient value chain, and that means you've got to have access to competitively priced feedstocks. Uh, these are different markets. And um, and so I think that, you know, if you look at things like sustainable aviation fuel scaling up, yeah. uh, that could be very large demand, but you need to have a value chain behind that that's reliable and cost competitive. Right. I think that, I guess it was a year ago, that people started talking more and more about UCO as a, as a stream, used cooking oil. Do we have any idea how much used cooking oil there is in the world? I don't personally have that number <laughs> at the, on the tip of my tongue, Dan. But there's, there's more than you might think, and it moves around the world. It's a I mean, global it come, trade. It's it a global comes trade. to the U.S. from other countries, including China. Um, and so it has become uh, a traded commodity. Now it is nowhere near the scale of conventional crude oil. Right. And that is, uh, that is the challenge is we've got to find ways to continue to create more of these feedstocks and not compete with food for right. humans or for, for uh, livestock and animals. Uh, a lot of good people in our industry and other industries are, are working on right. solving these challenges. Uh, Chevron, of course, has long experience in uh, geothermal and yesterday 
uh, Secretary uh, Jennifer Granholm made very clear that uh, very high priority for her is uh, geothermal. Just what are you doing on it now? Yeah, the, at one point we were one of the largest geothermal producers in the world, uh, primarily uh, with positions in Indonesia and the Philippines, kind of on the ring of fire. Um, conventional geothermal, where you, you'd bring up steam and run a turbine and generate power and then re-inject uh, re the water. Uh, what that you can do that in certain geographies where you've got access to really good resource. What the secretary is very interested in, and, and there's a lot of work underway on our, uh, what are generally referred to as novel geothermal technologies that would not necessarily uh, follow that same model. Uh, so could you get into uh, uh, areas where there's not quite as much heat, where you might not have to go quite as deep? Can you use uh, some of the technologies that this industry now has, uh, you know, perfected or certainly improved with directional drilling, hydraulic fracturing, and the ability to manage uh, subsurface fluid flow to create um, essentially a, a way to extract heat from the earth and then pull that heat out of some sort of a heat transfer fluid to, uh, to generate uh, heat or power at the surface. Uh, so we've got pilots underway uh, or agreed to, to pursue pilots in California, in Japan, uh, with companies that have been working on some of these technologies and can bring some of our expertise together uh, with them. You've got to prove out, does it work? Is it technically feasible? Is it economically feasible? Yeah. Are there unintended um, uh, consequences that you need to be thoughtful about? And so I know the secretary is very optimistic about this. Uh, we're working with um, good engineering and operating people right now to, to really learn about some of these new concepts and, um, and hopefully we can find ways to prove them right. up and scale them up. Right. I'd like to turn to policy uh, and ask you uh, just briefly reaction to the LNG pause from your perspective and then turn to the state of California. Yeah, I understand the intent to study uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, effects of uh, continued growth of the U.S. LNG business. Uh, what I think is undesirable is the signal it sends to others, which is uh, we may not be uh, as reliable a supplier. Things could change. Um, and so I think there's a, you know, we're, we're hearing from customers who, what does this mean? Uh, is there a chance your country would stop granting permits? People that are making long-term investments and want to make long-term commitments, this introduces uncertainty. Um, and I think the U.S. should be positioned as a reliable supplier. So I think there probably was an could have been another way to go out doing the study without necessarily pausing right. permits. Um, right. So uh, Chevron was once a upon a time standard of California. It's been your home for uh, decades, decades, decades. 145 years. 145 years. And uh, recently, you and colleagues have talked about what you call the increasingly harsh regulatory environment in California uh, and have said that California is one of the most difficult places to do business. It is. California has been pursuing policies to encourage investment in new types of energy technologies and actively working to discourage investment in traditional energy technologies. And they've accomplished their goal. They have made it very difficult to invest in our traditional oil and gas business, in, um, in refining, and capital is mobile and uh, we, we invest where we find an environment that offers the prospects for a return and increasingly those are difficult to find in California and our investment plans reflect that and I think over time uh, production of uh, oil and gas uh, and uh, availability of refined products is likely to reflect uh, investment choices that operators are making. What's the nature of the dialogue like with the state? It's the same as it's always been. I think it's, uh, you know, the state has uh, environmental objectives that they, they hold very dear. Uh, we try to engage with practical input on what customers are really doing, what markets are really doing, and, and, um, and that runs into kind of these aspirational goals. And um, I think that's the real risk is that the reality, uh, we're not going to have time to talk about um, vehicle sales right now, but the, the ambition and then what people actually do if they don't match up and you've structured, we have a minute to talk about vehicles you've structured your policy <laughs> for that um, you know you can create a real mismatch right and do you see see that happening right well I think I mean EVs look EVs are great they they are a terrific piece of technology they don't work for everybody they work for some customers but not for all and uh, we're seeing that in in consumer 
behavior and choices today. And so you have to, you know, you have to, we have to deal with the world as it is, not as it, you know, is modeled on a spreadsheet. And, um, and so we live, we live in the real world and have to allocate capital accordingly. Right. And so this is affecting your capital investment decisions. It is, absolutely. State. Yep. Um, what about, I mean, more generally, uh, what you've talked about is a need for a balanced energy conversation. Can you elaborate on what, what you think that means? Yeah, so there's three things that really matter when you talk about energy. Um, affordability, uh, and, and this is, I'm talking about this globally now, right? People need to be able to afford energy. And, and in much of the world, uh, that is the primary um, determinant. Um, uh, reliable energy supply matters, right? You, you, if, you, if the lights are not on all day long, it's hard to have a conference like this. You gotta have affordable energy, reliable energy, and then you wanna protect the environment. And policy needs to reflect all three of those. And when it tends to over-index on just one, you can get unintended outcomes. If all you care about is affordability, you're gonna have an environment that, that nobody really wants to live in. If all you care about is reliability, you're gonna have so much redundancy in the supply system, you can't afford it. And if all you worry about is the environment, you can create unintended consequences on the other two. We've seen that play out in, in Germany and Europe more broadly, where, uh, where, where they're now really having to deal with high costs and concerns about supply. And so, um, the way those three things balance uh, has to have context. Uh, different countries have different starting points. They've got different economic uh, realities and resource realities that they need to balance. And it's a conversation that uh, uh, we encourage everywhere that we work. Uh, there is no one answer. Uh, you don't find uh, solutions that work in Western Europe necessarily work in developing Africa. The ones that right. work here in the U.S. Uh, don't work in, uh, in Latin America and Asia, let's say. And so you have to respect each country's ability to make those choices and try to define a framework that works for them. All right. How many years did you say Chevron has been in business? As 145 years, founded in 1879. Right. So looking forward from that, um, and I was thinking that we began talking about uh, your young people, sending them to MIT to prepare them for uh, bringing those technologies together. Uh, as you look at the scale of the industry, but its challenges and its role, I mean, to the younger people in the audience, what do you want to say to them about uh, the future of the industry? Well, I don't think there's ever been, I, I, last year I, I, I tried to end with some optimism because there's lots of things we can find in the world to be pessimistic about. In this industry, there has never been a, a better time to work uh, in the energy industry. The need for innovation, the uh, proliferation of technologies, the inexorable growth in demand. I'm sure you've been talking about AI and data centers and what that means in terms of demand for power in this country, which has been dramatically changed here in, in recent times. Uh, the opportunity for young people to make a difference, to come into this industry and help define a path towards a, 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 a better future in a world that needs more and more and more of what we do every day. It's, it's never been more exciting. I wish I could be starting over mm -hmm. again as a young person and, and joining this industry today. Right. Well, Mike Worth, thank you very much for being with us today. Mm -hmm.